Hi, thanks so much for joining us for Online Church with Fort Alliance. I'm Pastor Ashley. I'm so pleased that you've chosen to join us today. A couple quick things before we head into our sermon with Pastor Ken. He's going to be talking about 1 John. We're looking forward to that. But just wanted to mention that Pastor Carlos and his wife Shay, uh, our new student ministries pastor, he is in Fort Saskatchewan now. Uh, They've just arrived. And so if you see them, make sure that you give them a big welcome. You can pop onto our website, fortsaskalliance.com and send them an email through our staff page to welcome them here. We trust that they are going to be such an asset, such a blessing to our church family, and we can't wait to start working with him and uh, start spending time with them. So if you see them, make sure that you say hello. Also wanted to let you know about the visa process that the family from Afghanistan is going through uh, right now, the family that we're sponsoring to come to Canada. Please be praying uh, for expediency in that process, as well as for protection for the family, for their extended family, and wisdom for us uh, as the Afghan and short-term missions team that we would have wisdom and guidance as we uh, seek to to put all the things in place that are necessary for them to come to Canada. Also wanted to say a big thank you for your giving. Uh, Your giving enables us to continue to serve Fort Saskatchewan and to do things like sponsor a family uh, to come from Afghanistan. And so if you would like to give, you can do that on our webpage, uh, at fortsaskalliance.com on the Give tab. Uh, you can also pop into the church, use the debit machine anytime that you would like. And uh, we are just so thankful for your gifts. Giving is a way that we worship God, a way that we um, tell to to God and to ourselves that everything that we have belongs to him and that we trust that he will take care of us. Let's take a moment and pray now before we get into our sermon. Heavenly Father, we come before you, O Lord, and we are thankful that we can gather in this way today. God, I pray that as Pastor Ken talks about discerning the spirits, Lord, that you would be speaking to our spirits, that you would be showing us your way, Lord, that you'd be moving, guiding, leading, convicting. Jesus, that you would bring peace where there needs to be peace, joy where there needs to be joy, that you would fill up what we're lacking. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to this time. Uh, We're glad to have those of you who are are with us and and joining us online. I I appreciate that that you're with us. I also really appreciate those of you that are are here. And uh, I'm really just trusting that uh, God will really and fully lead, guide and direct uh, my heart, my mind, my words today as we, we press into a topic that, at least in my circles growing up, um, and for much of my adult life too, in my circles, was really under-talked about, um, wasn't, wasn't spoken on near enough. And so I'm, I'm looking forward uh, for the chance to, to dive in and keep going in, in 1 John. We're going to get to chapter 4. Uh, now, as a means to kind of set the table for this, if you will, uh, I want to introduce you. Maybe I'm not introducing you, uh, but I'm going to introduce a term. It's called chronological snobism. It actually is a term that is kind of attributed to C.S. Lewis, he had a number of others that I think influenced him in that. But it's kind of this um, mentality, if you will, that um, the ideas and the thinking of previous times or past times are inferior to our thinking today. Because we're, after all, right, like we're definitely more enlightened and more advanced and you know, more developed as, you know, a human species. So, you know, we're, 
a little bit chronologically snobbish, if you will, right? Make sense? Probably the easiest way uh, to, to illustrate this would be, um, I think this is actually a real issue in our world because I got an iPhone. <laughs> I'm clearly smarter because in the palm of my hand, I hold like the information of the world wide web, right? Ironically enough, this is just my opinion. I don't have no facts or data to back up. Just telling you what I think. You can agree or disagree. It's up to you. But I kind of think in many ways, my iPhone, our iPhones, make us a little dumber. You don't agree? Oh, I got a couple of nods. Listen, I have had some ridiculous conversations over the year. None here in Fort Saskatchewan, Okay. Ridiculous conversations over the year where someone will come to me and be like, I watched this YouTube video. You're wrong. I'm like, do you know you just need to have a Gmail account to open up a YouTube channel? Anybody can make, my kids want to make YouTube channels. Like you don't have to be a scholar to have a YouTube channel, but watching a YouTube video makes people experts, right? Or, you know, vlogs or, or blogs. I've just had so many conversations where, you know, someone will bring, you know, an article to my attention that's written by a teenager. See? I'm like, oh my goodness. Chronological snobism, right? Like we, we think ideas and thought processes are just more advanced, right? Because, you know, we're Current generation, if you will. I really think that this chronological snobbism in my circles, okay, I don't want to say in all circles, in my circles over my years really has crept into my church experience on the topic we come to today. And the topic we're going to get to is actually the topic of evil spirits. And we're going to come to it from 1 John chapter 4. So with this kind of you know, way of introduction, thinking of chronological snobbism, Let's go to 1 John chapter 4, and we'll read it, and then I'll tell you, you know, why I kind of feel that way, and then we'll unpack the passage, okay? So here it is, 1 John chapter 4, and uh, we're going to read uh, verses 1 to 6. Here it is. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if they have the Spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people who belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them. But we belong to God. And those who know God listen to us. And if they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. So uh, kind of here's, here's what I mean about like my circles and, and this particular topic of the spirits. In, in, in my circles at least, I have personally been a part of even, okay, so I don't want to appear to be throwing stones. I've personally been a part of, of these issues, and, and I have definitely seen these, these issues play out. I, I have seen in the church people take a, a topic that has really only a handful of verses in the scriptures on it and like dig their heels in and come with total conviction that they know what's what and 
you know, what have you, right? I've, I've seen this on topics like tongues. I've seen this on topics like predestination. I've seen this on topics like women in leadership. And, and really, there's this small pocket, and we go, look, see, we know what we believe. It's right here. But then, when it comes to the topic of evil spirits, again, my circles, we just kind of step back, like, well, you know, like, that, that's how it was in Jesus' day. You know, but, you know, that, that's just not our experience here, you know. Uh, you know, that, that, that was maybe kind of how, you know, Jesus had to handle things a couple thousand years ago. But, you know, we're a little more developed. We're a little more enlightened. Like, that, that's just, you know, not our experience, you know. But the, the crazy part of this, this thinking or this mentality, at least again in my circles, is this. Although there is only a handful of, you know, verses or scriptures on some of those other topics that I've, I've been a part of those debates and arguments, and I've seen them happen, um, they're, they're like, there's like over 300 passages in Scripture around the demonic. Like, we're not talking about a couple passages. This is a, a, a overwhelmingly clear topic that this is, is a reality that exists. There's, there's this conflict between two kingdoms. The kingdom of God or of light. The kingdom that Jesus came and proclaimed. And a kingdom of darkness that's directly led and influenced by the devil and his demons. We don't talk about it a lot. We push it on the back burner so often. Almost like we, you know, that's just not for us. I know the moment we bring this topic up, it can bring a lot of you know, emotions or feelings. And so I just want to address it before we go on because I'm going to end on this. Don't be afraid. Don't be fearful as we, we, we process this. It'll come out more clearly, but we already read a verse that told us the one who's greater, right? It's okay. We don't have to be fearful. But we can be and we ought to be wise and discerning and testing the spirits. Scripture tells us to, after all. Now, one thing that I want to just kind of bring out here is a bit of a, a side note, a, a freebie. It doesn't fully fit with where I'm going, but I think it's too valuable to not, not share. Uh, I was actually having coffee with uh, one of our congregants this week, and we just had a great visit at Tim Hortons. We talked about all kinds of things, all kinds of subjects. But this was one of the subjects we were talking about, um, and, and it came up, we were talking about uh, just the, the demonic um, realm and that part and how it functions and, and what have you. And I personally am actually convinced that there's actually geographical spirits as well, that there's geographical strongholds and, and in particular areas that manifest in certain ways in Fort Saskatchewan too. And uh, I'm totally convinced of this, this kingdom battle, this kingdom battle, that in Fort Saskatchewan, it most commonly plays out in power and control. You go back and study the history of this area, the history of the settlement of, of Fort Saskatchewan, and you see it established as a center of power and control. And these physical realities are, are, are presented, but then they start playing out in the spiritual realm. And I'm not going to name any, but I can see this even still today um, in businesses, in families, and any of you who've been a part of our church and know any of the history don't have to stop for long and think, oh, <laughs> yeah, a power and control in Fort Alliance. Yeah, 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 we fought that fight. Mm-hmm. See what I'm saying? I'm convinced of that. Freebie. I really believe there are actually geographical spirits at play that we have to be aware of if we're going to fight kingdom fights and if we're going to stand firm and, and be a part of Jesus' kingdom. And so, anyways, freebie, sharing that. That all said, this is my favorite part from the text for today. Well, we'll unpack a lot of things, but this is my personal favorite. I could not um, miss this. It was so, so important to me. I don't know if you were able to tune in last week and watch Pastor Ashley or if you were here last week, but if you weren't, you need to go back. She did such a great job at unpacking the text before. But just as a quick reminder, it was about loving God and loving others. 
This is no coincidence. I mean, in fact, I actually picked 1 John because I knew the times we were in and I knew what was happening in the season of life we were in. And this whole letter is really about 1 John establishing that we're to be a people of fellowship, fellowship with God and fellowship with each other. And this looks like or comes alive as a people who love God and love others. And I knew we needed to just kind of focus on that as the main thing. And so the, the passage right before this starts with loving God. Interestingly enough, if you kind of skip ahead, you'll notice after this passage, it's also about love. Next week, we get into how God is love. The week after, we get into, once again, love others. No coincidence, love. John wants to bring this out. He's the disciple who's known for abiding in Christ and knowing the love of Christ, and he wants that to be so central to who we are and what we're about. And then right in the middle of this section on love, he says, oh, but by the way, it's still important that you test the spirits. This isn't a coincidence. We're to be a people of love because God is love and we are to love others. But even as a people of love, still be wise. Test the spirits. Love. Test the spirits. God is love. Love one another, which is what we're getting to. But test the spirits. And that's where we are today. Now, as we think on this and we begin to understand, this word test is important for us. It says that we are to, uh, you must test them to see if the spirit they have comes from God. Uh, the, The word test in the old scriptures and the ancient scriptures um, also is translated as prove or examine. One commentator I was reading, uh, he, he, he wrote it or he, he spoke of it like this. This word could also be used in regards to coins or weights. And what he meant by that is it was important to test or to prove or to examine coins to see that they really were of value and what they you know, were stamped with, right? It was important to you know, test and to prove and to examine the weights that you would measure food with to ensure that no one was cheating someone, right? Test, prove, examine. Likewise, amongst the people of God, it's important to test the spirits, to examine to prove where these spirits come from. And I think that's important to also note, this spirit is manifesting amongst the people, within the people of God. Now I know, in the life of Jesus and throughout Acts, you see Jesus, the disciples, actively in the marketplace, actively in the streets, actively um, out and about in the public, dealing with the demonic. But we are kidding ourselves, and here's a perfect example, if we think that reality doesn't happen amongst the people of God, too. We must test the spirits to see. I've I've taught on um, this before, and I'm just going to say it with total clarity so that no one misses what I'm thinking here and and what have you. I'm not going to go back and reteach it, but if you you here right now have questions, we can unpack it after this or... You know, those who are part of, uh, you know, our Sunday gathering, we'll give them a chance to unpack it with me too. But when I say that the demonic or, or, or spirits are, are, are even a part of the fellowship within the church, I mean that they really are active and a part of the fellowship and, 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 and meddling in the life of the church. And that even, yes, in believers, the demonics can manifest, the demons can manifest, they can have ground, um, they, can, they can even be actively a part of one's life. Now, the words oppression and possession are just so misused. The real way scripture teaches is demonization. And the reality is, is that demons manifest in the church and among believers. And if you don't believe me, let's just go back to my example of power and control and think back of the history of our church. Totally, Right? You know what I mean. And so we need to test the spirits and examine them and see if they are from God or if they are not. And so the, the text goes on, kind of gives us a, a, a means to, be, to begin to do this, to start to do this. And, and, and so uh, it says, test and see, for there are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if they have the spirit of God. If a person claims to be a prophet, 
or claim, if a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in real, bo- real body, that person has the Spirit of God. And so we're to press in and, and to, to, to ask and to, to test the spirits, to call the spirits to attention and, and find out, do you believe? Spirit attention, do you believe that Jesus is God in flesh, that he really came? Now, Here's what I've come to learn in some of my training and some of my experience and, and some of my walking through a deliverance process with others. Them demons, they lie. I know, that's surprising. I mean, after all, we see, uh, you know, in James, even the demons believe, right? And so you, I've learned you've got to press in on this. Do you believe that Jesus is God in flesh? Spirit of attention, do you believe Jesus is Lord? Spirit of attention, do you be, or do you hold to Jesus as your Lord? Spirit of attention, what purpose do you have in this person, in this people? You've got to learn to test the spirits, to press in. Now, interestingly enough, as I've studied this, it, it, this was mind-blowing to me when I, I first realized. This was actively a part of the life of the early church. In fact, Every Gentile that came to Jesus in the life of the early church went through a deliverance process. In fact, they went through a deliverance process before they were baptized. Why? Because the occult and and the demonic was so woven through culture, not all unlike our culture, that the church knew we had to ensure there was no ground for that to be active. And yet we get to our day and that chronological snobism mentality concept well, slips in and we're like, well, you know, that was the early church. That was Jesus' day. No, this is so, so important. Oh, how I long to be a part of a gathering of Jesus people who don't just stop at I believe in Jesus, but see Jesus freeing the oppressed and the captives. I'm actually, here's a little kind of look ahead, if you will. I'm so excited right now for the, for the fall, uh, um, for the winter that's to come. Not that I'm not going to give my all in the spring and summer, but I'm so excited. I've been, some of you know actually because you're on, on my prayer list, but I've been going through a, a renewal training, and, and I weekly take training and I'm coming to that po- the point now where I, I, I'm actively um, being trained in how to help others hear God and how to help others really identify the voice of Jesus and then to move to that place of finding new levels of, of freedom. And I just can't wait to start to unpack that more as a fellowship. Because Jesus, man, there's always more. And he wants us to just be a people that are so convinced of who he is and what he's called us into, that we're connected in such a way that we see others find the freedom that we found. I, I'm so excited for the days that are coming. That's look, looking ahead, though. I don't want get, to get too far into that. But test. Test the spirit. Don't allow just anyone to come and to speak. Test the Spirit. See, is this from from God or is it from something else? Ensure that this is the case. Now, maybe it's possible some of you are thinking, well, are you sure John's talking about the demonic spirits, Pastor? Like, are you sure that's what he's getting after here? Okay, that's fair. You're welcome to wonder. I mean, after all, I've, I've heard people say things like, I have the gift of discernment, Pastor Ken. You need to be careful. That person is not a very nice guy. Okay, let's just unpack that for a moment. That's actually being judgmental, not discerning, first of all. But discernment in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as we find this as a gift, um, actually is a gift to identify evil spirits. 
For some people I have seen that have the gift of discernment, this is so true of them, they can actually see the evil spirits. So it's not talking about that gift of discernment. You know, is this person a nice guy or not? not. The gift of discernment is really the gift to identify the demonic. The church needs that. Our church needs that, that gift. Because the gifts are for the purpose of edifying, building up, and encouraging. And how much simpler would it be to deal with power control if we could just see it quickly and identify it, call it out, and get that thing out of here? You know what I mean? The sermon is so important amongst God people. It's not just a, oh, that person's not a good person or a nice guy. No, 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 no. That's not biblical. All right? Biblical discernment is to actually identify the evil spirits. Now, interesting enough, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it follows up with 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which every single one of you have heard, love. Just like our text in 1 John. Love, discern. Love, love. Right? But how do I know in this instance it's not? Let's just take a quick look at verse 3. If someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of antichrist. That's definitely not a nice guy's spirit. We're talking about demonic here, right? Definitely. Now here's one more freebie, okay? Text here goes on. What you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. This is my personal opinion. Again, it doesn't matter if you agree with me on this one or not. This is just what I'm convinced of based on this passage and what I see throughout human history. The, capital T, the Antichrist is coming. But the spirit of Antichrist is already active. And as I look at human history and I look at life in the world today, (laughs) I can just see how there is a spirit that is active that looks to do nothing but bring glory unto itself and destroy others. Just look at human history. We're not talking about just something that is not a nice guy. We're talking about something that is a kingdom versus kingdom battle. But back to where I was kind of starting at the beginning. I don't want you to be fearful. I don't want you to have the sense of, oh, now what do I do, Pastor? Because guess what? Four and five are so, so freeing and important for us. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than than the spirit who lives in the world. Beginning of six, we belong to God. This is important. In my journey, I was so not taught about this stuff, and I've already mentioned that. 20-ish years ago, I am working in central California. I, uh, I'm, I'm involved in a camp that's serving really difficult, difficult realities and, and kids who are coming from rough, rough neighborhoods. And, and this is like my first week on the job and all of a sudden, this kid comes off the bus and he is screaming, just And we're like, this is gonna be a tough one. We get to our first kind of I mean, we, we do a lot of fun stuff and, and basketball and all kinds of things, but we get to our first, like, chapel time, and all of a sudden, this kid begins manifesting, and there's a voice coming out of this little boy that is not of this world. So we get together as a staff, and we're like, uh, something's going on here. This ain't good. We're like, yeah, no, no, it's not. So we're like, so what are we going to do? They look at me like, Ken, didn't you go to Bible college for one year? <laughs> He's yours. <laughs> Great. I just told you about the circles I grew up in. We didn't talk about this stuff. But here's what I knew. This verse means so much to me because of this situation. I knew, and I was convinced, that the one who was in me is greater than the one in the world. And All I had in my tool belt of training at this point in my life was I got Jesus. That's it. 
I had nothing else. I got Jesus. He's in me. And the next day I went to that kid. I threw him over my shoulders, took him through the activities of the day. And that day, night took him into the, to the chapel over my shoulders and all of a sudden the voice of a little boy. Just enjoying the time with other children. Now, I don't know what I did other than say, Jesus, you're in me, you're greater. Please help. So I don't want you to think, well, I haven't been trained enough. I haven't been studied enough. The one who is in you is greater than the one in the world. There's only one that I, that I am that you are to fear. Fear God. He alone is the one who can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. And what does God have to say about fear? He has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. Even in 1 John, love others, be discerning, test the spirits, like be wise, right? And then, but God is love, <laughs> love others, which we'll get to next week and the week after. So don't be afraid. The one who is in you is greater. But we got to, as God's people, be aware. We got to, as God's people, more and more test. Because the freedom that Jesus longs to bring today is the same freedom that he actively displayed 2,000 years ago. And his people, us, were called to release the captives, to set the oppressed free. Just like we talked about over Easter. And so even as a fellowship, as we continue to press into 1 John and love, and then as we start to think about renewal and the fall and then the winter, oh, I'm excited. We're going to do some training. We're going to learn to hear. But in the meantime, we'll love with no fear because the one who's in us is greater. And so I want to actually just kind of wrap up by praying for you who are here and you who've kind of stuck with us online. And I want to invite the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to just come and fill us in a fresh way that we might, without fear, step out and be a people who love and yet be wise and test but then again, acknowledge God is love and so love others. So would you just bow with me as we wrap this up? Papa, we come and we just want to thank you that you have created and brought us to life, have done so through Jesus and that Jesus, you have given your life for us. You've offered yourself on that cross for us. We're so, so grateful. Thank you. Your love was first displayed through that sacrifice. And likewise, we want to be a people of, of love. And yet we ask that we would be wise, discerning, and grow in our capacity to test the spirits. Because you've asked us to. So that we might be more effective in knowing your love and displaying your love. We recognize that there's no need to fear because we're in you, Jesus. Our identity is in you. Thank you that we can have the authority to just stand firm and have no fear and love. We also recognize that this authority is expanded, if you will, as we're more intimate and we get to know you more personally. So continue to draw us in deeper relationship with you. That we might just actively have the faith to test and to love. So Holy Spirit, we open our heart to you. We pray for a fresh fill-in today. We pray that you would just come upon us and give us the power, the love, and the sound mind to 
to, to be a people who love, who are discerning, who know God's love, and who love others. In your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you for joining us today. If something that you saw or heard has stirred your heart, if there's something that you would like to talk about, pray about, if you have questions, uh, we would love to connect with you. You can go to our webpage, fortsaskalliance.com, hit the About tab, go to the staff page, and you can email any of our staff members. We would love to talk with you more about who Jesus is, about what he can mean for your life, or anything that's going on in your life. Again, thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you next week.